Today is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Recalling our baptisms, we cross ourselves in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us therefore go to our gracious Heavenly Father, confessing our sins. In the Old Testament reading, God promises, my word shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish and shall succeed. But we do not trust you in all things. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed. Forgive us, Heavenly Father. Then God tells us, you shall, not, you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. But we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. Hear us, free us, and lead us in paths pleasing to you, Heavenly Father. In the Gospel, our Lord explains that the one who hears the word and understands it bears fruit. By the grace of God, we believe and understand that Jesus, the Word of God in the flesh, succeeded in destroying death and rising victorious for us. For his sake, God forgives us and uses us to bear fruit for him. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the word planted inside you produce a great harvest for our gracious Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Bless, Lord, since you have created all scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. But through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this sixth Sunday after Pentecost is from Isaiah chapter 55, beginning at the 10th verse. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up 
since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. And as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
I shall reflect on both the Old Testament reading and the Gospel reading. Let us pray. Father, do indeed remind us by the power of the Holy Spirit, the anchor that we have, namely your word. Your word spoke creation into existence. Your word was indeed the proclamation in redemption that our sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. And your word continues to speak to us in the process of sanctification worked by the Holy Spirit. Enable us to yield ourselves fully to your word, to surround ourselves with your word, to so suffuse ourselves with your word that we might have power, we might have confidence, we might have hope, we might have faith as we face these very uncertain days. For all those who are frightened and full of anxiety, we ask that you draw near to them and the power of the Holy Spirit to be their sustaining force. Lead them to see that this is still your world and you're still working to bring the good out of whatever circumstances that might seem negative. Empower us to yield ourselves to your providential care worked wonderfully for us in word and in sacrament and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless our time together as we engage your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My dear brothers and sisters, the story is told of a girl who could do anything in the world. She just had to choose something. One day she came upon a blank canvas and some paint. She began to paint one stroke and then another. the subsequent strokes were more perfect than the previous ones. She smiled as she painted. She had pride in her masterpiece. She had a gift. She was an artist. Every fiber of her being told her that she was an artist. After she looked at her masterpiece, a thought came into her mind. The thought was whether she was spinning her wheels by pushing paint on a canvas. She thought maybe that she she should be doing something more important. That the world was big and there were many things to see and to do. She thought those thoughts and then she decided to do something other than wasting her time painting. Should she study medicine? Should she teach? She had an array of possibilities before her, but she was stumped. Twenty-five years later, the girl was in tears. 
She had been on a long journey for many years. She had been so enamored by the array of possibilities before her as a gifted child that she never did anything meaningful. And so she learned a hard life lesson that life is not about shiny possibilities. Life is about making a decision, a decision that moves you and enables you to make the world better. The girl who was now more than a girl went to an art store. She bought a blank canvas, she bought some paint. She went to the nearest park and she began to paint. One stroke after the other, and each stroke was more perfect than the previous as she, as she had experienced as a child. She smiled. Then she decided. She decided to spend the rest of the day in the park and into the evening, but she decided. She decided. And with her decision, other joys were yielded. Her decision made all the difference in the world. My dear brothers and sisters, there is no more freeing feeling than to make a decision, to move beyond the ambivalence of many possibilities and to decide. There is power in deciding. There is power in making a decision. Both the Old Testament reading and the Gospel reading enjoin us to make a decision to be bearers of the Word of God to a dark world, to a broken world, a world in which God is still active. A member in our congregation shared with me what the Lord told her when she was reading the Bible. She said she was reading Psalm 24 and then she was comforted by the thought that this world is God's world despite the, the virus, despite the social discord. This is God's world. Indeed, this is God's world. And God wants us to decide to take responsibility for this world. Yes, heaven is our home. That's true. But right now, in the meantime, the Lord wants people to be bearers of his word in this broken world, this world that needs the healing of the word of God. It is incumbent upon us to decide, to help us to make that decision. The prophet Isaiah says, as the rain came, comes down from heaven, as the snow comes down from heaven, and they both go into the ground providing water 
producing seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so the word of God does not return to the, lo to the Lord void or empty. In other words, it is God who provides possibilities for the world in which we live. The word of God is the intelligence of God, the wisdom of God. It is loaded with the possibilities of God for this life. It was God who spoke in the beginning, let there be light. Let there be this, let there be that, and it was all good. God structured the world in such a way that life would be made possible. That was a function of love, that God creates a world out of the chaos and out of the madness and makes life possible for us. That's the power of his word. It is God who has possibilities, and without God, there would be no world. If there's structure in the world, then God made that possible with the possibilities that God brought about, moving and driving the world to the place that he wants it to go. It is his world. He takes responsibility for his world. But it is not enough for God to merely have possibilities within the word. There must be people who respond to the world. In other words, God needs partners in bettering the world. God needs people who hear the creative, powerful word and who act upon it. So the prophet says, you will go out in joy and in peace. And the hills and the mountains will rise up before you. The trees of the field will clap their hands before you. Meaning that the people of God who commit themselves to partnering with God, using his word, will experience a tremendous blessing and empowerment, especially to the thing to which God commits himself. The prophet Isaiah was talking about Jews in Babylonia, encouraging them to return to Jerusalem to build the place up. Many had garnered wealth over there and they did not want to return. But the prophet is saying, in essence, God has committed himself, God's word is committed to rebuilding this city because something profoundly great is going to occur in the future in this city. A most miraculous thing will occur. And so those who participate in being a partner with God, being a bearer of the word of God, to better the Jerusalem, they will experience profound blessings. Yes, they have riches there in Babylonia, but do the riches really satisfy their souls? Maybe their souls need something stronger. Maybe their souls need a, a, a task, a problem, a difficult thing to stretch the soul. And coming to Jerusalem indeed to work out that city and to establish it was indeed something that stretched the soul. But more importantly, God was tied to that city and God's name was tied to it. His word was tied to it. So those who worked with the Lord in bettering that city would be blessed and empowered by God who still loves the city of peace. Like his father in the Old Testament, Jesus needs partners. Jesus is indeed the word incarnate, but Jesus at the beginning of his ministry chose 12 men to do his ministry, to do the ministry of binding the strong men and taking away from the strong men souls that were enslaved to the strong men, namely Satan. They were to preach the gospel, to liberate people, to love people, and thereby make the world a better place through that process. Jesus speaks about the sower, and he is indeed the sower of the word. The word belongs to him. He's the one that sows the word in any given worship service throughout the world. It is Jesus who is disseminating the word. 
And the question before Jesus is, is there a partner here? Is there a soul that is ready to receive the word and experience profound growth through the word? Now he speaks about several hindrances to the word, namely ignorance, attachment to things in this world, attachments to riches, not having rootedness. Jesus is talking about the quality of the soul that is able to receive his word to be a true partner with him in driving out the demonic. So what is the, the soul that is most conducive to the word of God, the word of Jesus? It is the soul that is humble. It is the soul that is open to God's word and open to the world as well. It is the soul that is teachable, just like Jesus and his mother Mary. They were both humble, but they were teachable. That's what humility means, to be teachable. They were both teachable. They would listen and hear, to, and hear people. Sometimes Jesus, before doing a miracle, would ask the people, what is it that you want me to do for you? As the perfect son of God, he knew what the person needed, but he would ask them and invite them to tell him so that he would hear them articulate what their struggles were. So to be humble is this ability to hear, to hear God primarily, but also to hear the world, to respond to the world in a proper way. If ministry is to be done, we must be able to hear, to hear people and what they are telling us. It is not enough for us to go with an agenda before people. We must go and hear what it is that they are saying. There are many who are not being heard today. Dr. Martin Luther King said that, of course, he was against rioting because it was against his core fundamental principle of love. But he said that oftentimes rioting is the language of those who are not heard. Whom are we not hearing today in the church? Whom do we need to hear to take seriously in order to properly minister to them? For too long the church, various manifestations of the church in various churches were cultural and ethnic enclaves. A certain people would worship with their type. Like-minded people who looked the same, they would worship with their type. And they were not open to others. That's how the church was for a long time. In fact, I recall many, many years ago, I went to an, a, a, a Coptic Orthodox church after my own worship service. A friend invited me to worship to the worship service there and to the festival that they were having. I had my clerical collar on. It was obvious that I was a spiritual leader. I had to wait for my friend an hour and a half. But as I waited for him, I never felt more uncomfortable because when I would look at people, they would turn their heads down and not look at me. Nobody approached me, nobody said hello, nobody showed any kind of hospitality because I was different. I was an outsider. I was not like them. For too long, the church was like that. I once went to a Lutheran church back east, a worship service. I was at a conference that I had my collar on once again, and I went to this worship service. I sat in the worship service. The pastor invited everybody to go to the, to the fellowship hall for refreshments, and so I did that. I went to the fellowship hall for refreshments. Nobody approached me, and once again, as I looked, they turned their heads away. That is the church that was false and wrong, and it cannot be that way anymore. 
We must be now be a people who hear and listen and set our agendas aside to go listen and hear people and mold our ministry based upon what we hear to respond to it just like Jesus. Jesus wants us to partner with him to be conduits of the word to this world, to heal it, to face it, to embrace it, to love it, and to be active in it, and not to run away from it. For so many years, scholars of every discipline have tried to understand what precipitated the Holocaust during World War II. But a more existential question was, why was it that the Jews suffered so? Where was God amid the evil of the Holocaust? But for the people who are spiritually sensitive, there's a more profound question. And that is, where were righteous people in World War II Germany? Germany was a Christian nation. Germany knew Jesus. Germany knew the Ten Commandments. Where were the righteous people? Why were there just a few people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer who revolted against Hitler? who saw it as their responsibility to engage the world, to make the world better through the word of God. Why was there just a few? I know I'm asking rhetorical questions. And the simple answer is simply that God always works through a few people, through a remnant to bring about changes. That's how God operates. And that's how God is going to operate even in this present crisis. What's beyond the present crisis What we know is that God and humans will make the difference. God will provide the possibilities and humans who respond to those possibilities will make this situation better. Jesus wants partners, people who take the word and bear it to the real world, the world that belongs to Jesus. Forget about heaven. Yes, heaven is your home. That's where we are going, but right now, this life is your life, and we do not want to escape it, run from it, but face it through the power of the Word of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus is looking for a partner. If you decide to be his partner in the Word, you will realize a profound amount of meaning in your life. Amen.
Luke the Evangelist wrote of our risen Lord that when he was at table with the disciples at Emmaus, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is Christ's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. Let us open our hearts to one another as Christ has opened his heart to us, and God will be glorified. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on the weakness of our mortal flesh and suffered death in the grave, yet by the power of his resurrection he opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, ever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, God of all living, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. We bless your name. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, Almighty God, Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, blessed are you. Before the foundation of the world, you chose us to be your children. You have liberated us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your dear Son, the very image and reflection of your glory. For him the universe was made. In him we have received redemption and the forgiveness of all of our sins. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he's betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is new testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, Lord God, we commemorate that Christ had to suffer and die, but most of all, that he is the firstborn of the whole creation that glorified at your right hand, he speaks on our behalf, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead on the day which you have appointed. We pray, Lord our God, send us your Holy Spirit, the Spirit who brings the life, the power of Jesus Christ. We pray that we may surrender ourselves completely to your service, and that in the midst of the world, and before the eyes of all your people, we may live your gospel and be the sign of peace, that we may support and serve each other in love, that our heart, eyes may be open to the poor, the sick, and the dying, all who are in need, so that, they may be the church of, that we may be the church of Jesus Christ under the sign of suffering united with all your people, the living and the dead in the mystical union of Christ. Through him and with him and in him, you are blessed, Lord our God, Heavenly Father, in union with the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve the true faith and life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. <laughs>